Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, I'm uh, Mark Allen. I'm from uh, Xenotech in the UK, and um, I really the aim of our of my talks basically to try and um, give an idea of uh, some of our experiences um, with trying to use higher methods in an industrial context. Um, if I can briefly introduce Xenotech, uh, we're based in Bristol in the UK. Uh, there's a team of six of us. We're all former BE systems, uh, and we all have a background in. Uh, industrializing um, computational engineering research, um, mainly for aerospace applications. However, we also branched out now into automotive and renewables and, and so on. Um, we have um, two um, products that we work on um, at the moment. So we have um, ZCFD, that's our CFD solver. Um, so I'll go into a bit more detail on that uh, later on. Uh, we also have another product called EPIC. Um, which is essentially a, a cloud HPC portal. And so that can provide access to scalable, secure, and uh, HPC on demand effectively. And um, yeah, using Epic, you can connect to um, multiple providers and you can choose a, an HPC provider that, that best matches your requirements. Um, it's effectively a pay-per-use model, so you don't need to have any capital expenditure on HPC and EPIC handles um, things like managing clusters and jobs and, and, and all that type of thing. So there's a link to EPIC there if uh, anyone wishes to have a look and, and see what it's about. Um, so just to give an overview of the talk, um, I will um, briefly go over some of the software features of ZCFD, and then I will go through some CFD applications where we've tried to use high order CFD um, essentially in areas where finite volume methods are, are typically dominant. Um, I've also also give some examples of some CAA, some aeroacoustics applications, and then I'll just try and summarize what our kind of views are of, of um, the ability of high order methods in, in, in industrial contexts. Um, so really, as I say, the aim is to try and provide a an industrial perspective on the use of these methods, um, given that industry doesn't tend to have the uh, availability of um, the compute power that the, the C academia has. Um, so if I can just quickly go over the um, solver features. Um, so the so ZCFD has uh, effectively two solver modes. We can run finite volume or we can run discontinuous clerking. Um, the finite volume solver has um, geometric multigrid and local time stepping and low Mach number preconditioning for convergence and acceleration. Uh, if, we're running dual time, if we're running time accurate, we use dual time stepping. Um, there's a variety of RANS turbulence models, and you can run LES and DES. Uh, the finite volume solver um, runs on arbitrary polyhedra, and uh, we currently have a, a pressure-based um, incompressible solver under development. And the, the solver runs on both CPs, CPUs and GPUs. Um, our DG solver tends to mimic most of the capabilities in the finite volume solver. So we, rather than geometric multigrid, we use polynomial multigrid or multipoly if you prefer. Uh, we have local time stepping and low Mach number preconditioning, all for convergence acceleration. And again, we use dual time stepping for time accuracy. Uh, we also have shock capturing and we have a two equations turbulence model. Uh, we use the SSTK log omega um, version. And um, yeah, we can run LES and DES as well. Um, the, 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 the DG solver is restricted to known cell types. However, we do handle um, hanging faces on Cartesian meshes. And I should obviously um, acknowledge the fact that we have benefited considerably from, from working with the PIFR team um, in, in the past. Um, we also, um, as an extension to the CFD solver, we have an aeroacoustic solver, so that solves the acoustic perturbation equations. And in order to generate some broadband noise predictions, we have a stochastic noise source generator as well. And so I'll briefly go over that uh, later on in the talk as well. We typically run the acoustic solver on the GPUs, which then leaves the host processor available. So we can use the host processor to effectively generate the stochastic noise, stochastic noise sources and pass those over to the, the GPUs. Um, so I'd like to, yeah, so the, the, the two examples in terms of CFD I'll give, uh, the first one is a, an automotive example. And here um, we were trying to use high order methods to see if we could try and get a similar level of accuracy um, to the kind of incumbent finite volume methods. 
but ideally be able to reduce the simulation time by virtue of um, coarse grids and high spatial order. Um, so that was essentially the question we were trying to answer. And then in the second case, um, and I believe there's a talk later on today, which, will, which I'm sure will be much higher fidelity, uh, we have our built environment um, test case that was, uh, was, was done by Arup in the UK. And uh, really the question we were trying to answer here was using high order methods and turbulence modeling and GPUs, are we able to observe um, some extreme events that were um, seen in experiment um, at a, an industrial, industrially affordable cost? Um, so, so for the automotive examples, so just to give some background, really the motivation behind this was, you know, I'm, I'm sure we've all seen this kind of standard test case of the Euler vortex um, propagating through the domain. Uh, on the right hand side, we can see the um, convergence um, properties of the solver. So effectively, the higher order you go, the steeper that convergence curve becomes. Um, but I guess what was of particular uh, interest to us was the fact that if we take the total simulation time, divide that by the number of solution points, we get a, a cost per solution point. Um, and what we see is that as you go to higher orders of accuracy, the cost per solution point goes down um, by virtue of the numerical efficiency of the, the method. Um, I should say these results are sort of two or three years old uh, and they were done in CPU, so I, I expect actually the, the uh, cost benefit is even greater now, especially when we're running on GPUs. But this was the motivation behind trying to see if we could speed up the, the, um, the, the, the calculation time uh, compared to a sort of standard finite volume method. Um, so the test case was a, it's a fairly standard wind mirror test case, so this was, a, this was primarily aimed at air acoustics. Um, so here we have a, a, a tetrahedral mesh, tetrahedral prism mesh generated with ISOM CFD. Um, and as you can see on the right hand side, we had variable orders of um, variable element orders uh, throughout the mesh. So we had high order where we were interested um, in the, the flow details. Um, the Reynolds number 520,000. It was a low Mach number test case, which is which I'll, you know, I'll discuss a bit more later on. Um, and we ran two meshes giving 4 million and 17 million solution points. And we used polynomial multigrid and dual time stepping to try and accelerate the, the simulation. Um, so on to the results. Um, so, the, the, um, so this was just a, a monitor point just behind the wing mirror. Um, so we have the results from Fluent in red. That was, uh, those were the published results in the, the IAA paper back in 2006. We have our results in blue and orange. So the, the orange being the final grid. Uh, and then the, the, I guess what we were trying to benchmark against was the open form results. So we all got relatively, relatively similar results. We all got sort of a, a spectrum that looked reasonable. Um, however, to answer the question that we were, we were originally asked, what, um, that are we able to turn these simulations around in a faster time? Um, the answer was, was no, we weren't. Um, and really the main reason for that was the cost uh, involved in trying to converge the inner dual time stepping iterations was just too prohibitive. We, we couldn't compete against um, uh, an incompressible solver at that um, flow speed. Um, so that will yeah, kind of serve uh, one of our uh, conclusions later on. And then the second test case we looked at was a built environment um, building example. And so again, as I said before, the, the, the aim of this study was to try and assess the potential of higher order methods um, to observe these extreme events that were seen on experiment. And so here we were used, utilizing DES modeling to, to allow us to run a high Reynolds number and then GPUs in high order to try and uh, reduce the runtime. Um, so um, again, this, this I'm sure this will be covered in much more detail later on. Um, this, this test case was tested in, in um, things of Polony wind tunnel in, in Italy. Um, so the test case was a, a, simple, um, a, a simple rectangular building geometry. Uh, of one meter cord and um, two meters height and 0.3 meters um, depth. Um, the inlet flow velocity at one meter was 10 meters per second, uh, and the Reynolds number was around 800,000. And then the experiment, they, they varied the, the, wind, um, the wind angle. Um, and what we were trying to observe in this case, if we look at the bottom right curve, we can see there's um, spikes that are uh, marked with the red arrow. So around every 50 seconds, there was this. Um, a low pressure spike that was observed at the corner on the leeward side. And so the hypothesis uh, was that this is due to vort a vertical structure originating off of the top of the model. Um, so really we were trying to see if we could try and get some of these spikes at an affordable cost. 
Um, the model setup, um, so it's a standard inflow and outflow boundary condition. Um, we didn't have um, tunnel uh, wall boundary conditions on the floor. Um, it was slip walls on the side and the top. Um, we did have a, an inlet velocity profile at the bottom right. You can see how it compares with the experiment. And the building was orientated at about 20 degrees to the, um, to the flow direction. Um, so here's a, a, a visualization of the mesh. Uh, so the mesh, is, the mesh that was used is in blue. Um, so you can see it's a structured mesh as it's a fairly simple geometry. It was refined to the wall um, to allow us to, to, to um, capture the RANS part the, for the DES. Uh, and you can also see in red that the, the, the mesh has just been subdivided to show the additional refinement you would get. For example, you were using something like um, P4 elements um, so the simulation details, we ran this on a DGX1 system supplied by SCAN in the UK. Uh, we, had, uh, we ran it on eight Tesla V100s, I think there was 128 gigabytes of RAM available. Uh, we used SST Kilog Omega DES model uh, with dual time stepping with a, a pretty small time step given the, the sample period that we would probably have needed. Uh, we used polynomial multigrid and local time stepping. And there were 30 million solution points in the simulation, and that was using um, P2 elements. Um, I should say that all of the details of this are, are available uh, on the um, GTC website. This was presented by um, Tariq Saeed uh, from Arup. Um, we, this, this simulation took us around 160 hours to, to simulate 0.7 seconds, which clearly wasn't going to be enough to, to pick up the, um, the, these kind of extreme events. Um, we did have a, an inter-GPU um, data transfer issue, and so that's, that's down to about 100 hours now. But in any case, it was going to be um, far, far too expensive to, to model the, these extreme events. Um, here's a, a flow visualization. Um, so you can see the vertical structure from the, 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 top of the, um, the top of the model. And then we can see some sort of finer scale turbulence, um, sort of propagating over the leeward side. And if we just have a, a look at some um, comparisons with the experiment, so if we have a look at tile A, which is in the top right hand corner, um, we can see that, um, yeah, so we took two measurement locations, uh, one right at the very corner of the, the building and then one a bit further in. So the, 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 the power spectral density a bit further in was seemed to be relatively similar to the experimental value, uh, although it's, it's quite clear we have insufficient um, simulated time to adequately resolve the, the spectrum. Um, closer to the, the corner, we can see that the power spectral density seems to be shifted down quite a bit. Um, and suspect that, that may well be due to the, the RANS modeling. It was probably in RANS mode at that point, and we didn't, you know, we didn't really pick up the, the fluctuations um, sufficiently well. But to try and summarize our, our experiences so far, um, and this is caveated for it being low speed flow um, using a compressible flow solver. Um, in terms of spatial accuracy, of course, high order methods are far, far more efficient. However, for us, um, time marching is the, is the limitation which is reducing the competitiveness of this method. Um, again, that's caveated with the, with, with the fact that this is for low speed flow only. Um, and really, I guess the, the, the challenges that we're coming across is that for many engineers that, 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 that we speak with, the accuracy tends to be secondary to the turnaround time. Uh, engineers want these simulations turned around a lot faster so that they can do their design work. And additionally, there's, um, there's a lot of strong competition out there, particularly from the lattice Boltzmann method, um, which is particularly fast for uh, high fidelity CFD. Um, and it's also um, it's quite easy to, to generate meshes for it. Um, so moving on to aeroacoustics, so we've, had a, we've had a lot more success with aeroacoustics. So um, in terms of the, we, we've, we've run a nose landing gear example. So here we were trying to use the high order um, how the solver to propagate acoustic waves and then supply that, supply that with stochastic M sound sources with the aim being um, can we actually try and predict the um, turbulence generated from a, a complex geometry. Um, so just a kind of overview of the, the, the path of the acoustic solver. So we can take acoustic sources from URANs, DES, LES and so on. Alternatively, we can take a RAND simulation, use a stochastic noise generator generate some acoustic sources, that goes into the acoustic solver, and then we get a radiated noise field. So here we have an example for a, this is the lagoon geometry. Um, 
the stochastic noise generated for itself is um, it's, uh, based on the FRPM method from DLR. Um, it's the, the idea behind the method is to take a RAND simulation, and from the RAND simulation you can take the streamlines and some information about turbulence, so turbulent kinetic energy and turbulent integral length scale. Uh, we then have a, a random field propagating along these streamlines, and we filter that random field such that we end up achieving a, a turbulent energy spectrum, which we which we predefine. Um, from that, we can get some. Uh, we can get a fluctuating stream function from which we can derive some turbulent velocities, and then we can derive some uh, acoustic sources. So here we have an example of um, a trailing edge noise simulation where we have the um, the the the, the um, uh, the, the FRPM uh, acoustic sources propagating over the trailing edge and then generating the subsequent dipolar sound field. And if you've got any interest in that method, then there's a, a, a link to the, uh, there's a, a reference to the FRPM method uh, at the bottom there. Um, the, the, high, the kind of uh, complex test case we looked at was a partial dress closed cavity nose landing gear. Again, it's a low speed test case. The RANS part of that ran on um, 24V100s for about three and a half hours, and then acoustic simulation took about 1.2 hours to get a, a, a statistically converged result. And so you can see the, the complexity of the, the model uh, in, in, in the bottom right. Um, so here we have a visualization of the acoustic sources that we got from the FRPM method. Um, and those are those would go into the, the acoustic solver to, to generate the noise field. And so here we have some validation. Um, so we have uh, we, we've taken the, um, the sound measurements at uh, microphone locations four, five, six, seven, and eight that you can see in the bottom right there. And as you can see, slightly compared with um, uh, the, 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 the sort of the, the, the lattice bolts methods, which are you know particularly which, which have been shown to be particularly good in this regime, um, we seem to get very similar results. But as I say, we, we turn this around in about 1.2 hours. Um, so we're a good, probably an order of magnitude faster. Um, so really to summarize, we were able to, to do that kind of broadband noise simulation using the, the high order um, propagator and turn that around in sort of less than five hours. Um, so I guess one thing that I haven't touched on, uh, I didn't touch on it for the safety either, but obviously mesh generation remains a problem. In terms of air acoustics, it's yet another mesh that you have to generate, and you do have to be really quite careful when generating acoustic meshes because it just takes one small cell to um, re reduce your overall time step and make the simulation much more expensive. Um, so one thing that we have been starting to look at is immersed boundary methods. So having a Cartesian refined background mesh and then have um, yeah have an immersed boundary uh, boundary condition. And um, so here we have a um, effectively just a, a cylinder, an immersed boundary cylinder within this, this um, refined Cartesian background mesh. And in this test case, we have an acoustic pulse and we're trying to simulate the scattering uh, over, the, over the cylinder. And just to give an idea of the, the sound, the, the, the uh, result. And so yeah, we have this kind of cat, um, scattered, uh, this scattered pressure field. And this, this is run using um, yeah, P4 elements uh, on, a, on a single NVIDIA K80. Um, and so we can compare our results with uh, the analytical results for this solution. And as you can see, um, the, 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 the MERS boundary method that we used back down to second order at the boundary. So although it was um, fourth order polynomials elsewhere, it was only second order. Uh, accuracy at the boundary. Even still, we were able to get a, 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 a fairly good uh, a fairly good prediction in comparison with the analytical result. Uh, another thing that we've been looking at is um, body fitted Cartesian dominant meshes, and so we we we're, we're effectively in this method we're trying to um, effectively merge out small volumes and, and sort of end up with just a. a um, an arbitrary polyhedra at the, at the boundary conditions themselves. And so again, here we're back down to second order at the, at the boundaries. But all of this is to try and come up with a robust solution um, to, to generate uh, your acoustic meshes. And again, this simulation is with the FRPM method. And so we can see uh, our result is in blue and that's compared with um, previously published results. Um, from DLR. So again, we were, you know, we're very similar to, to, to yeah, to elsewhere. Um, so really then, just to try and summarize, um, so high order CFD 
um, certainly remains of interest for, for high, high fidelity safety simulations. Uh, in our experience so far, um, further work is required to try and improve the time marching for low speed flows. Obviously, one thing that we're beginning to consider is can we can we actually have a, a fully incompressible version? So we have a, uh, an elliptic continuity equation version. So rather than low Mach number preconditioning or artificial viscosity, we have a, a truly incompressible solver. Uh, obviously, mesh generation remains an issue. Uh, and in particular, um, engineers don't want to have to try and simplify the geometries to be able to um, to be able to provide meshes for high order methods, which is somewhere that Lattice Boltzmann does do very well. It can easily handle um, complex geometries and, and generally provides quite good results. Um, Air acoustics has, has definitely benefited, benefited from uh, these high order methods. We can get stable, efficient solutions. And really, the only caveat there is you have to be careful with mesh generation. Uh, therefore, our interest in immersed boundary methods and uh, arbitrary polyhedra. Um, near the walls. Um, so that's a very brief uh, summary of kind of our experiences so far with how the methods. Um, does anyone have any questions? <laughs>